Chantilise is an anime-styled action RPG developed and released in 2006 by the Japanese game developer Easy Game Station, who you may know better as the developers of Reketeer. That's right, the answer to the poll was that I'm a weeb! What, you thought that I'm a furry just because my name is Fino the Fox? And that I'm best friends with furries? And I'm writing a furry comic with Ryan and have a furry original character? Oh, fuck. Anyway, it was localized and published in the West by Carpe Folger, who would also do the same for Reketeer, which proved to be quite popular. However, my personal favorite of the two games has always been Chantelise, and I felt it hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. I aim to improve that a bit with this video. I will be spoiling most things about this game, so if you've been interested in playing it and would like to experience it for yourself first, I'd recommend doing so before continuing with this video. This will also be acting as something of an abridged playthrough of the game as well as a review. So without further ado, let's begin. Chantelise opens with a cinematic detailing the backstory of our main characters, two sisters by the name of Chant and Elise. I've heard some pronounce Chant's name as Shantae, though I won't be doing so. In my experience, the name Shantae typically has an accent over the E where it does not in game. There's also heavy use of magic featured in the game, and characters are known to recite incantations, sort of like a chant. So the name may be something of a pun, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Elise tells a story when the two sisters were younger. They often heard tales not to go out when the moon shone red, or they would be cursed by an evil witch for the rest of their lives. However, one night they were compelled to go out by a force they didn't comprehend. After walking around, lost in the forest, they encounter a being silhouetted in the moonlight before passing out. Upon waking up, Elise finds that her elder sister has indeed been cursed and now takes the form of a small fairy. So, in an effort to undo the curse, the two set out on a quest to find the witch. We meet our two heroes in the plains outside of a town. The two seem travel-worn and wish to stop and rest, but are interrupted by a woman's scream. After battling some slimes, the scream is revealed to have originated from a woman named Ira, who is thankful to the two for rescuing her. Seeing that the two sisters are in need of aid, and to repay them for saving her, she invites the two back to her home for some food. The sisters deliberate on whether or not to accept, before eventually doing so, as Ira takes her leave. The planes act as a tutorial, though I'll be covering the gameplay as we continue with the game, so I'll skip over that here. The only inhabitants of the planes are the most basic enemies in the game, slimes. For now, their only method of attacking is jumping at the player. Simply hitting them three times with your sword is enough to kill them, and you'll find that they drop these multicolored gems. The gems act as your magic in this game, and are spent when casting spells. They come in four colors representing the four elements of magic available to you. Water, earth, fire, and air. Or, I guess, technically weather. The magic system is where the brunt of combat really comes in, but as I said before, I'll discuss that later. After killing all slimes in the area, the gate to the exit unlocks. This establishes the rules of the game. For each area, you must kill all enemies in order to proceed. Before doing so, however, we can come up to a hidey hole in the top right and encounter some purple slimes. Under normal circumstances, you're unable to kill them until later. However, if you use two green gems, they are combined into a powerful lightning strike attack. Killing them in this way unlocks a secret chest. There's one of these in every level of the game. I'll show the first five or so to give you an idea of how varied some of the secrets can be, but mostly I'll just focus on the important ones. Opening this chest gives us a golden pedestal, which is a treasure that we can sell later. We exit through the cave, thus concluding the introduction. The sisters arrive at Ira's house. Ira is revealed to run an item shop in town, and quickly begins cooking the two a meal. She appears to be quite a cook, and the two find it delicious. Ira and Elise discuss what the sisters are searching for, informing them that there are numerous ruins around the town, but she can't think of where the witch may be hiding. They enjoy the food until they are told what some of the food is composed of, particularly a slime liver marinade. Presumably, collecting slime livers is what got her into the encounter in the plains. Chant seems particularly disturbed by what she's been made to eat, and the two decide to take their leave. Standing in the town square, Chant continues to lament about the food they ate. Elise is more upbeat, seeming to admire Ira a lot for her kindness. Chant remarks that Ira seems a lot like Elise, which makes her happy. The two walk around town speaking to locals for information. Hey, a fairy! She looks like a bug! Let me touch your fairy! Buy me dinner first. Huh, apparently the town priest is away. 
I love this lady's character design. I'm almost convinced she must have been a protagonist in a game Easy Game Station didn't finish making. Speaking of designs, if it isn't obvious by now, the game features a mix of 2D sprites for characters and enemies and 3D environments. The mixture works surprisingly well, at least in most cases, but the sprite work in particular is fantastic. It's honestly my favorite sprite art style that I've ever seen. The character's clothing is really detailed and intricate while also being expressive and readable, not to mention cute. And hey, with such a cute game, this must be pretty easy, right? Oh, you'll see. You'll see. Anyway, people seem to recall something about a witch in the past, but nothing useful comes of it. The two return to Ira, who suggests that they could check in with the town fortune teller to see if she might point them in the right direction. Chant immediately wants to head there, but Ira suggests that they stay and rest in her spare bedroom, as it's getting late. Elise is worried that they're imposing too much on their host, but Chant isn't so polite and speaks on their behalf, which is fine by Ira. The following morning, the two leave to find the fortune teller, or, in my case, I immediately go back to Ira and sell the treasure from back in the plains. I also buy two pheromones, which acts as a health upgrade. You'll need those. You'll notice that the price of the pheromone increases with each purchase. This is part of the balancing of the game. Items you purchase appreciate in value, while items you sell depreciate. Capitalism ho! The two head to the fortune tellers, with her poorly keyed fences, but there's a note saying that she's not actually in. Rather, she's at the nearby Terran ruins. With our lead, we head out. In the first stage of the Terran Ruins, we're introduced to a bug enemy. As of right now, the only attack they have is a roll. It does little damage and is really easy to avoid. Just wail on them and they'll die quickly. After defeating all the enemies, another of those purple slimes appears near the start of the stage. Either use two green gems or two blue gems to kill it for the treasure, which in this case is another pheromon. Yay, health! In the next stage, if we immediately head to the west, we can find a treasure chest in a small alcove containing a souvenir charm, which increases your magic defense. I don't ever tend to use these, but I probably should. A lot of enemies use magic attacks in this game. Now, this doesn't count as a secret treasure chest. Rather, this is just your standard chest that you can find on some levels. Secret chests will always be hidden, like the one in this stage where you hit this left pillar to reveal the chest. So, yes, not all secret chests involve purple slimes. This chest has a wooden shield, which increases physical defense. You might notice as I fight enemies that I do a lot of jumping attacks. I don't have any hard data to go on, but purely anecdotally, it seems to me that jumping attacks result in critical hits more often. I think it's because the vertical strike animation is the only one that can result in a critical hit, so if your attacks are all vertical strikes, naturally they'll happen more frequently but take that with a grain of salt. Heading on to the next stage, we'll begin by attacking these torches. I haven't pointed it out before, but attacking certain things within stages will drop gems too, not just enemies. Torches will give you fire gems, grass will give you air gems, barrels will give you water, and uh, I don't actually know of anything that will give you earth gems. Besides that though, these torches are also what will give us our hidden treasure. Bust it all, and at the end, you'll get a pair of leather gloves, which will increase the power of your physical attacks. The stage has eye bats, which fly around and shoot a magical ring attack. This does a ton of damage, and these enemies will likely be your first death in the game. The worms also have a magic attack now, in the form of a gas that they spit out, which will also do strong damage. Unfortunately, these two attacks are where the 2D sprites and the 3D world mix can become a problem. It can be kind of hard to tell where these attacks are in 3D space, which can result in walking right into them. Especially with the gas, sometimes if you get hit by it, it can be difficult to escape it without walking right back into it, which can be frustrating since it drops your health so quickly. Anyway, we kill all the enemies and head into the next room. This is our first skeleton! Skeletons are unique enemies in this game, as they're immune to physical attacks. The only way to kill them is to use magic. Under normal circumstances, this would pose a problem, as you could get into a situation where you have no gems, effectively locking you into a battle that you're doomed to fail. But luckily, the game accounts for this. While you can't kill them with physical attacks, using them will still force the skeleton to drop gems. They hand you the means to destroy them. Make sure to keep a fire gem and run to the top of the stage. Stand on the chandelier and use a fire gem to destroy the barrel at the other side of the room. This will give you a focus staff, 
which increases the power of your magic attacks. In the next stage, we run past all the enemies and find a large skeleton at the exit. As with the small skeletons, use a magic attack and the chest will spawn. Inside it are speed boots, which, as they sound, will increase Elise's running speed if worn, which can be useful for evading attacks. It's especially nice because, if you die, you'll have to run all the way back from the beginning of the Terran Ruins, so this can cut back significantly on travel time. Definitely pick these up. In the next room, we encounter a girl with pink hair, who seemingly was expecting us. Chant wastes no time getting into an argument with her. The girl insults Chant's height, causing her to claim she's the sexiest woman on the planet. Even Elise can't side with her sister on that. Regardless, after all the arguing ceases, the girl recites some incantations, summoning the Terran Golem, the boss of this zone. As you can see, bosses in this game are fully rendered in 3D, which is actually a good thing. With such powerful attacks, some of which go off screen, like with this jumping attack, it's a lot more important to be able to know exactly where they lie in three dimensional space. There's three targets on the golem, one for the crystals in each arm and one in the center. If you destroy the arms, which is easiest to do after it attacks, a small chest will spawn, containing yet another pheromone. The boss is significantly easier without its arms. Best to use magic if you have it, but if not, it's not too hard to simply attack it with your sword. The boss also has a laser attack, so be careful with that. After destroying the boss, we get the ability to equip three items. The girl instantly has a change of heart, seeming to think that there's no longer a need to fight. Chant isn't so eager to stop fighting. The girl makes her escape, as Elise and Chant wonder about who she was. Chant even remarks that she's a talented magician. The two note that they didn't find the fortune teller, and decide to head back to town empty-handed. Hey ladies! You smell like dirt! Oh, hey, the fortune teller is back. Let's head inside! Okay, yeah. So, to the surprise of no one, the girl from the ruins is the fortune teller. I have to say, I love the character writing in this game. The dynamics between all of them is so great. A particular highlight has to be Chant and Elma. Uh, oh yeah, the fortune teller is named Elma, by the way. The two of them constantly go at it whenever they talk to each other. Their arguments are so fun to read. Chant immediately wants to kick Elma's ass, or rather, her shins, but Elise is acting strange. She seemingly doesn't remember the encounter that happened mere moments before. Chant tries to argue with her, but Elise shuts it down, claiming Chant is being incredibly rude and insulting. Elma disregards this and says that the two must be there for a fortune. After Elise recounts the story, Elma simply says that the two must go to the Eggnon Ruins. Chant seems annoyed that Elma didn't even have to use a crystal ball or anything, but Elma remarks that doing such things are just cheap theatrics. I like Elma. No bullshitting. I don't need a crystal ball, I'm the real deal! Chant is naturally suspicious that the girl who just attacked them is sending them off to another set of ruins, but lacking any other leads, the two agree to go. After leaving, Elma notes that Elise's memory has been affected by fairy dust. She says pushing Elise further is dangerous, but cryptically states that she doesn't have time to worry about that. Back outside, Chant further questions Elise about Elma, and how Elise didn't seem to recognize her. Elise reveals that she's been feeling lightheaded since leaving the Terran Ruins. This, of course, worries Chant, who says they should rest. Elise assures Chant that she'll be fine, and the two head off to the Ignon Ruins. But first, the townsfolk say the priest is back, though they seem somewhat put off by him. Hmm. Well, let's go see. Oh my god. Uh, no pun intended. Look at this guy! He's huge! Is this what belief in a higher power gets you? If so, I finally get it. Time to crack open a Bible and get jacked. Truly a man carrying the weight of the sins of his flock. I'm not so sure about the neckbeard, but you have to admit, if this guy told you you needed to change the way you live your life, it'd be hard to argue. I love how in cutscenes they move the characters around a bit to help sell the action. This visual novel aesthetic for the cutscenes can be kind of limiting since they only have a small selection of images to use for characters talking, but puppeting them around like this helps a lot. Anyway, the priest seems like a cool guy. He says he'll give you information in exchange for a donation. But it's not gold he wants, it's... yourself. Chant naturally assumes the worst. After all, he is a priest, but the priest denies that. What he actually wants is your health, 
more specifically your HP. Yes, you can donate your actual HP to get hints about where the hidden treasures are in the game. I would advise against this, obviously. That's a pretty severe detriment to put yourself through in a game as difficult as this, and even if you get a hint, it comes in the form of a riddle, which are often quite vague as to what they could actually mean. You could argue it isn't in the quote-unquote spirit of the game, but I'd honestly just recommend looking for a guide if you want them all. Sacrificing HP is just too much. Chant seems more open to the idea, but Elise recognizes that that means she's the only one losing in this situation. Heading back to Ira's shop, they reveal that they have indeed met the fortune teller, but Chant of course has her reservations. Ira says that while she hasn't personally met with her, the town has strong acclaim to her accuracy. They say they're going to head to the Ignon Ruins, but Ira says they should stay for dinner first, so of course the two head for the Ignon Ruins as fast as their legs and wings can take them. Oh wow, listen to this music. It's so much more intense than the actual area. I mean, it's not bad. Actually, I like the music in this game quite a bit. It's just too much. I'm gonna change the music. Do you mind if I change the music? I'm gonna change the music. Phew, that's better. Okay, so in this stage you have wasps. They'll infinitely spawn out of the nest, so make a beeline straight for- uh, that's not a pun. Anyway, make a beeline straight to the nest and destroy them. This is another instance of the 2D and 3D mix making it a bit difficult to see where you are. Sheesh. Oh, hey, a mushroom! Oh, they're so cute. Oh, shit. Oh, shit! Shit! The next stage is bob -omb Battlefield. As you climb up the mountain, the sun will create a glare effect. It's at this point that it's undeniably apparent that something is a bit off about my version in the game. In case you haven't noticed, this game is usually 4x3. Now, I'm not stretching out the footage to be widescreen. No, I'm using a mod to make the game widescreen. The HUD isn't moved, but I don't really mind that. For regular gameplay, and for the sake of the video, I'd much rather be playing in widescreen. It works well for the most part, but certain visual effects can appear strangely, like the aforementioned sun glare, or certain camera tricks and cutscenes. I've been editing the cutscenes to do that blurry border thing, but without it, there's this kind of weird aqua color on the borders. And when you're in the menu... Yeah, so I'm changing that for the video. Still, figured it was worth noting. This level's enemies are bolstered by having these big rolling boulders. I'm not really sure if their rolling is random or if they're on a series of predetermined paths, but it can be surprisingly difficult to judge how they're going to bounce off walls regardless. I usually take at least a couple of hits here. In the next stage, we're inside a volcano. A new enemy is introduced, one of my least favorites in the game. These are bombs. They fire spells at you, but with a twist. Upon defeating them, they explode as their name implies. These suck, because unlike the skeletons, you can totally get into a situation where you run out of gems and simply have to tank a hit because you can no longer kill them from a distance. This area also has slimes that spawn out of the magma. I think it's infinite until you leave, but I could be wrong. Continuing on, this area has a ton of skeletons, which is partially annoying and partially a good thing. You'll see why soon. For now, make sure to hit them a lot and get yourself a nice supply of gems you can come back to. Over in a little cubby hole beside the stairs, there's a shell shroom. These enemies are invulnerable to physical attacks for as long as they're inside their shell, only becoming attackable when they themselves open to attack. Sort of like those Mets from Mega Man. You can, however, use magic to destroy them while they're in the shell, and as with the skeleton, when they're hiding, they make for a decent enemy to farm gems on. Killing them will reveal a hidden chest, which has a standard charm inside. This one I'll actually be using for its magic defense, as we're about to have one of the few mini-bosses in the game. Yes, the mini-boss is a larger, more powerful bomb. This is why I recommended farming gems, as if you were to kill this in close range, you'd get a hell of a damaging blast from it. Instead, use your magic and blow its ass up. In the next area, you're going to want to equip your speed boots. I'm going to be honest and say I don't know exactly how this hidden treasure works. The basic idea is you need to run along the top level of the stage and eventually it'll pop. Sometimes I've gotten it on the first lap, other times the third, other times the fifth or sixth. I don't know if it's a time limit thing, or if you have to do it in a specific way, but I just keep running until it works. Inside, you'll get the winged boots. 
These are awesome. If you chain dodges with the right timing, you can travel through the air almost indefinitely as long as you don't mess up. You're going to need these for some secrets, so absolutely make sure to grab these. This stage introduces not one, but two new enemies, and they're both kind of frustrating for similar reasons. The first is a ghost. These are extremely simple to kill, but boring. When they're transparent, you can't damage them, but you can when they're opaque. You'll usually be able to attack them before they can even cast their magic, so it just becomes a long waiting game. And there's quite a lot of them, so this gets tedious pretty fast. The next new enemy is a knight. They have a shield that makes them completely vulnerable to attacks from the front. They also have complete magic resistance. No getting around that. Instead, you have to wait for them to attack and hit them from behind. Unfortunately, their sprite is inconsistent and can show that they're facing away from you when they actually aren't, so you end up getting a bunch of blank hits, which can be really annoying. I end up with low HP in this area, unfortunately. This is maybe my biggest gripe with the game. The developers decided that simply having red text stating you have low HP wasn't enough, so they added this beeping. If there's no food around to heal yourself with, you might be dealing with this for minutes at a time. And yes, you're stuck with this. There's no in-game option to disable it, and no mod at the time of this video. It's terrible. But onto the final room. The two sisters encounter a mural. They seem to have troubles determining what it's meant to be until Elma steps in to help. She reveals that it's a girl fighting a monster and that something is flying around her. Chant says it's dust, while Elise says it looks like moss. Elma isn't amused. Chant doesn't buy that it's a fairy. After all, why would a fairy be helping a girl fight monsters? That sounds stupid. Elma explains that evil has been on the rise, and it happened right as the two sisters arrived. She believes the mural to be connected to them. She reveals that there have been other pairs of fairy swordswomen, but that they always vanish. It seems that they always sacrifice themselves to seal evil away. They intend to continue talking, but are rudely interrupted by a giant, giant enemy, enemy crab. crab. Apparently, it's been chasing Elma all the way here. Elma would have mentioned that, but she had to make sure the timing of her monologue was dramatic enough. God, I love this game. Elise is starting to get disenchanted by the whole ordeal. It probably doesn't help that Elma bolts. Okay, 10 health, no problem. Just gotta... nope. <sighs> well, there's my first death. Time to run back. There's four pits in the arena. If you use that, you can knock it on its back, and then you can attack its weak point for massive damage. If you hit the crab into all four pits, it will unlock the hidden chest, which contains the strong arm band. This boosts the chances of getting a critical hit. The fight mostly consists of baiting out attacks to leave an opening to do a three-hit combo to push it into the pits. It also has an attack where it spits fire out of the volcano on its back, which is totally random to avoid and pisses me off. There's also a bubble attack, which is similar to the gas attacks in that it can be a bit difficult to judge its placement. After defeating the crab, we have the ability to use three magic stones, which is huge, but we'll get into that later. Chant, as usual, is not pleased with Elma, and makes threats on her shins, as is her usual go-to. But, uh-oh, Elise is acting strange again. Oh, yep, she collapsed. Somehow, Chant was able to drag Elise's unconscious body back to Ira's. Ira tells Chant that Elise is overdosing on fairy dust. Chant naturally assumes it's her fairy dust that's the cause, but Ira disagrees. Apparently fairy dust from a blood relative shouldn't have any effect on her. So she must be encountering fairy dust somewhere else. Hey wait, how come Ira knows so much about fairies? Hmm. Anyway. Ira knows of a medicine to counteract her ailment, but doesn't have the ingredients. She needs the blue rose, a flower that grows in the nearby Aquan ruins. I swear, everything around this town is just a ruin. Chan runs out as soon as she hears that she can help Elise, because she's a great sister. She's nearly at the town gate when she's stopped by Elma. She insinuates that Chan won't be able to get the flower, as she's too weak on her own. Chant is about to engage in a rousing round of shin-kicking when Elma reasons with her. 
Chan apparently can't use magic on her own, and can't do non-shin based attacks, meaning it's unlikely she'll be able to do much without help. Hey, how come Elma knows so much about fairies? Hmm. Elma offers to help, and in order to make things easier, she takes on a different form. Whoa, okay. This might be the cutest thing I've ever seen. Shoutouts to palette swaps. Huh? Lady, your hair's a different color now, isn't it? If you go to the priest, Chant has a chat with him. Apparently, he's been stung by a jellyfish. That's... weird. Moving on. Going back to Ira's, she's not at all surprised to find Elma has joined Chant. Even Elma herself seems to find it strange that Ira's so carefree about it. Chant says they'll be off to get the rose, but Elma stays and talks for a second. She wonders why she suddenly felt compelled to come to the store, and asks Ira if she knows. Ira seems to half-heartedly say that she doesn't, to which Elma says she's a bad liar before leaving. Onto the Aquan Ruins. Right from the start, equip the winged boots and run straight to the exit. You'll have to avoid the water, so you'll need them to cross some gaps. When you reach the end, the hidden treasure will spawn, containing mermaid shoes. These make it so that you can run normally through water without slowing down, which is extremely useful in... basically only this area. Water isn't frequently encountered in Chantilise. You'll definitely want to wear them here though, as we have a new enemy. Fish! These are surprisingly difficult enemies. They're small, fast, and hit like a truck. They can actually come on land, too! Luckily, we have a new tool at our disposal. As I said before, after defeating the last boss, we now have the ability to use up to three magic gems at a time. Three earth gems summon a rock that falls from the sky. Weak. Three fire gems create a ring of fire. Three water gems are an extremely useful healing spell. Finally, three green gems are a super powerful tornado that sucks in enemies and does massive, massive damage. damage. Use these whenever you see fish around to take them out quickly and easily. In the next area, get your hover boots back out. Run along the edge of the bridge, using the boots to quickly skip across the bits that extend out. Reaching the end of the bridge will reveal the chest, which contains a fire crystal. This can be great for skeletons, as it applies a magic buff to your sword, making physical attacks do magic damage, killing them. There's a few more knights on this bridge, which is kind of annoying, and further evidence that their sprite is all screwy. Heading inside the ruins, we get a mid-zone cutscene. Weird! Chant is feeling down that she's useless on her own, fearing she may be a burden on Elise. Elma reveals that it is precisely due to Chant that Elise is so powerful. Chant's fairy dust coats Elise's weapon and armor, which absorbs the magic from the monsters in the form of gems. It's surprising that they bothered to try and give an in-universe explanation for this, but hey, I'm not complaining. On the left, you'll find a music box, in case you want to pick a certain song to listen to. Speaking of music, man, the Aquan Ruins music is great. I don't know what god of the video game world decided that water levels have to have the most chill, relaxing beats in every game, even though most water levels are terrible, but hey, I'm not complaining. The next area appears to be a flooded town that we can just walk in for some reason. Now that we're submerged, the fish are flying, but they're a lot slower and easier to deal with but now they have a bubble attack. Great. At the end of this area, there's a graveyard with a lot of skeletons. You can easily kill them with your fire crystal or attack them normally to farm gems as I do here. I'm going to take the opportunity now to point out one of the minor gripes I have with this game. I wish the world you're exploring were contextualized and fleshed out a bit better. Every place we explore are simply stated to be ruins, but ruins of what? How and why were they ruined? What are these places? Here we're in a flooded town, but this is on top of some kind of castle or something, right? What's going on here? And again, it's a town, right? So people lived here? What were they like? The game doesn't explore any of this. You just have the town where Ira and Elma live and the ruins. That's all you have for the setting. I know it's a game with a small dev team, but I still think they could have done more. Anyway, heading inside the cathedral, we'll have some enemies and another bomb mini-boss. Just lower its health and finish it off with a magic attack- Uh, uh oh. Oops. Man, the priest should come check this place out. It looks like exactly the kind of place he'd want to visit. 
drop down into the next zone for another exciting cutscene. Surprisingly, Elma seems to be enjoying spending time with Chant, remarking that it must be nice to have someone to travel with all the time. Chant asks if she's an only child, to which Elma reveals she has amnesia and doesn't remember anything prior to arriving in the town. She does say that traveling with Chant does somehow seem familiar, however. God, this is so obvious. She breaks the tension by saying she wouldn't want a bratty sister like Chant, whom retorts with the expected Shin-based threats before being distracted by the appearance of the Blue Rose. But just then, a giant electric jellyfish arrives to- Hey, wait a minute! This boss fight is really easy. The jellyfish is invulnerable until you hit its two tendrils, which will reveal its weak point. They placed a pit beneath the jellyfish, so your best bet is to use magic. Unfortunately, the pit also means that the tornado spawns inside of it, so using three air stones is no use here. The jellyfish boss's main attack is to spin around while lightning shoots out of its tendrils. This is easy to jump over, but for some reason it's deceptive. I often think the tendril on the other side of the arena is in the foreground rather than the background and try to jump over it. I think maybe it's because the jellyfish is somewhat transparent, or maybe I'm just stupid. In any case, you shouldn't really have any reason to die. Uh. We kill the boss without any incident and gain the ability to equip up to four items. Neat! Chant claims the flower and begins to wonder what it is and how it got here. Elma seems to come to some kind of revelation, speaking of some mystery person who would have foretold that they would be here. Regardless, they head back to town and Elma transforms back into her usual form while distorting my screen again. Elma bids Chant farewell. Chant invites Elma back to Iris for some food, which Elma wisely declines. Chant says that after Elise is cured, they'll stop by her place to see her. Elma says she looks forward to seeing them, ending the chapter. Elise appears to be dreaming. She sees an unknown woman with dark hair before her who apologizes to her. The woman claims that she is the cause of everything that's happened to them. However, she then says that what she did to Elma was terrible so the woman may not be talking to Elise at all. Indeed, she continues to say that whoever she is speaking to will carry on her work. She doesn't blame the person she's speaking to for hating her, though she had hoped that wouldn't be the case. She says she has to go, and the vision ends as the woman wishes a farewell to Ira. Just then, Elise wakes up. Ira is immediately there to greet her, and explains that she passed out in the Ignan ruins, and that Chant was able to save her. We find that Chant is sleeping, dreaming about Shins. As they continue talking, Elise is reminded of the dream she had. Elise explains the dream to Ira and that she mentioned both her and Elma. She also says that Ira reminds her of the woman she saw. Ira, suddenly growing serious, asks what the woman said. Elise explains that she apologized and Ira seems to be lost in thought. Elise apologizes, saying it was just a dream and she shouldn't have brought it up, and Ira explains it away as simply being a side effect of the Blue Rose. She then ushers Elise back to bed, though I doubt Elise is too tired considering she just came out of a coma, but whatever. Ira is seen pondering the blue rose. Similarly to Elma, she understands that the woman placed it there to be found when the next pair of sisters arrived. Ira seems to think that when the end of the journey arrives, Chant and Elise will hate her too, seeming to imply they're in some kind of cycle, possibly meaning that Chant will die. Meanwhile, Chant and Elise head to Elma's. Just like at the start of the game, however, Elma is missing in action, despite saying before that she would be waiting expectantly for their arrival. They find another note which tells them that she'll be waiting at the Zephyrin ruins, and that what they seek is there, which is very similar to what she said about the Ignan ruins. After talking for a bit, they decide to head out. According to the townsfolk, there's a fisherman out on the plains! Let's go see him! This is probably the best cutscene in the game. Chant talks to the fisherman for a bit about what he's doing. Surprising absolutely no one, he's fishing. Look at Elise's face. She wants to fish so badly, dude. It's her one and only desire in life. Luckily for her, the man has a spare fishing pole. However, he states that they don't have any spare lures, explaining that they'll need one to catch a fish, and that they just need something shiny and with wings. God, I love this game. Off to the ruins. Oh great, now the slimes are spitting out gas. My favorite. 
Oh, look, a small pond. Catch a fish and win a prize. Equip the winged shoes. In the next area, fly across to the opposite side without getting in the water. Climb onto the bug in the middle and head to the exit, and get a secret chest containing a Ferriman GX. There's also a chest here containing a Night Shield, which is a huge boost in defense. Make sure to grab that. There's a ton of fish in the water here to kill. As usual, I'd tornado them up if I were you. It's also probably your last opportunity to get any real use out of the mermaid shoes, so you might as well. Keep those winged boots on in the next area though. We're going to run straight across the broken bridge and use them to fly across. This contains the earth crystal. I didn't use this until the end of the game, which is a shame. It's extremely powerful. Charging it causes an attack that hits multiple times in a row, which, when combined with a couple of the gloves, does a ton of damage. Hey, I'm not perfect. Though I will say, this crystal can make Elise... Kind of annoying. This area has a lot of shell shrooms, some of which are surrounded by water. Great. At least there's a skeleton, which you can bully for some gems. Killing everything causes the air mode to turn on, moving the rock and allowing you into the next stage. In the middle of this room, there's a metal shell shroom, which after killing, spawns a secret chest. This room kinda sucks. There's a lot of ghosts, a lot of floating eyeballs, a lot of gas spitting slimes, and a bomb to cap it all off, but it has nothing on the next room. First, equip your speed boots and run straight to the exit. Just follow the path that I'm taking. If you make it in time, you get the chest with S- Uh, you get a chest with the snowshoes! We'll get to those later. This room, as you probably saw when I ran across the entire thing, is enormous. There's enemies absolutely everywhere, and they're some of the worst kind. Plenty of bombs, ghosts, and eyeballs. <sighs> well, we only have to do it once, right? Run through, kill them all. Don't forget you can heal with three water crystals. Head out. Hey, now we're at the summit of a mountain. Wait, weren't we just inside a windmill? Wait, is this Dark Souls 2 logic? No! Whatever the case, Elma is here waiting for us. Chant is suitably annoyed that Elma sent us on another monster-filled ruin adventure. Elise is more easygoing about the ordeal, simply wishing to thank her. Instead of simply accepting, Elma says it was her fault, surprising the two. She says that traveling with Chant reminded her of who she was previously, which is a human-turned-fairy, like Chant. It was her fairy dust that made Elise sick. She goes on to imply that the reason she sent them to all the ruins around town was to make Elise stronger to defeat their enemy, but in doing so, she fell ill. Chant, feeling protective, asks why Elise should have to fight it. Elma starts to explain, but words are failing her. She begins to summon another boss, claiming the answers they seek will reveal themselves after defeating it. For some reason. And thus spawns the Aeolian... And thus spawns the Aeolian... Jesus Christ. And thus spawns the Aeolian... Fuck! This is... maybe the worst boss in the game? There's a ton of slimes and a ghost that spawns in the middle of the arena, indefinitely for the purpose of providing you with gems to shoot the wyvern down with. Meanwhile, the wyvern is flying and shooting extremely high damage magic at you, from above the arena, where you can't fucking see! Great. If you want, you can use the snowshoes here to make it so that you don't slide around. I don't do this because I'm stubborn, but you probably should. Walk onto the wyvern and shoot it down. This, unfortunately and frustratingly, isn't too consistent. If you do it while it's doing an animation other than floating in place, often the attack will just be ignored and the wyvern won't land. Fire is the best choice since it's a fast projectile. The next best is air. I don't think water is actually capable of downing it, at least not my experience, and earth definitely isn't capable. Actually, speaking of Earth, you might think this is the perfect time for using three Earth Stones. It spawns a huge rock from the sky, right? There's no better time for it. Well, you might be right. If the rock didn't fucking spawn beneath the wyvern. God, it's so useless. When you finally down the wyvern, try and hit its horns. This is easier said than done. Most of your attacks will probably go through its neck. When you destroy them both, you'll spawn the chest containing a soul pendant, which acts as an auto-revive. Neat! Be careful when you're attacking the downed wyvern, as it has a really strong AoE attack. 
Once you do it enough, as usual, the boss dies, and we get the ability to use four magic stones at once. Whoa. And then... Uh... Oh! My game crashed! That's never happened before! But, wait, there's no auto-saving. So, that means... Oh... Uh, Kill it again. Four stones, yay. Chant calls the wyvern a dragon, like an idiot. Elma reappears and begins talking about the red moon, at least talked about at the start of the game, confusing Chant while my cursor distractingly hovers in the center of the frame. Elise, however, sees it and points it out to Chant. The red moon, I mean, not my mouse cursor. We're introduced to two unfamiliar sisters, looking at the red moon from their home's window. They know that they should stay inside on nights like this, but the elder sister is compelled to go, and the younger one follows. The older sister states she's being beckoned by the moon and apologizes to the younger one. She doesn't know what will happen, but says she'll protect her no matter what, and not to be afraid. Meanwhile, Elise and Chant are transported to a strange area with the red moon in full view. She remembers the night Chant was transformed, and recognizes they're back to where they were at that time. She saw a woman with a huge sword, accompanied by a fairy, and realizes history is repeating itself. Indeed, the two girls appear before her exactly the same way Chant and Elise had at the time. The elder sister accuses Elise of being the witch, but Elise is distraught, realizing what's going on. Chant starts acting strange, and suddenly numerous magical gems fly from her, enveloping the young girls as they white out. They wake up and discuss what just happened. At first, Elise wonders if it was a dream, but Chant confirms that she saw it too, and that she turned the elder sister into a fairy, just as the witch had done before to them. The two are frustrated, feeling like they only have more questions now rather than answers, and decide to head back to town. Before doing so, however, they notice a giant castle floating in the sky. Back in town, they confront Ira, who already knows what's happening. She perfectly recounts the vision Chant and Elise saw, and Elise asks her if she was the witch, with Elma as the fairy beside her. Ira confirms that it's true, telling of a woman named Fortuna who had previously run the item shop. Ira seems to have admired her a lot, just as Elise does of Ira now. Ira explains that the castle is called the Sealed Palace, and that it always appears just as a pair of sisters arrives to stop it, which is what is happening now. This has apparently been happening for a long time. Before Chant and Elise, it was Ira and Elma, and before that, Fortuna and her sister. She beckons them to rest while they still can, as they have quite a battle before them. Chant does so, but Elise can't sleep, and Ira comes to speak with her. Elise has a lot of questions, but specifically asks about Elma. Chant had told her that Elma had amnesia, and figured it might have been Ira that wiped her memories. Ira confirmed this to be true. She'd used a medicine Fortuna synthesized from the fairy dust of her own sister. Since fairy dust causes amnesia, she used the dust on Elma to make her forget who she was and what she was. The reason for this is that when fairies run out of dust, they cease to exist. Knowing this would eventually happen to Elma if she didn't stop using her powers, this was Ira's only solution. She entrusts the medicine to Elise. It's now her decision if she wants to do the same. The following morning, the sisters tell Ira that they plan to attack the sealed palace after all. After wishing them luck and sending them on their way, Ira determines that she will do the same as Fortuna did if it means saving Chant and Elise. We're off to the sealed palace. Oh, right, these smaller jellyfish enemies. I didn't really talk about them before. They have really low health. You should be able to kill them in basically one hit usually. If you get hit by them, you're paralyzed for a few seconds. It's not actually paralysis. You can still move, it's just slower. There's an item called an antidote that you can use if you want, but it really isn't that much of a hindrance. I don't bother. Of course, they had to put shell shrooms on these floating platforms. <sighs> Near the end of the stage is a golden knight, but there's not really any difference between them and the standard knights. Get behind them, attack their literal ass, and the barrier to the palace is broken. Put those winged boots on for the next area. There's floating crystals on two platforms. 
You might notice they tend to shift around a bit. This is a visual glitch caused by the widescreen mod. In fact, you could see it earlier with torches and a few other effects in the game. Anyway, break the crystals and then a barrel in a pool at the center of the stage for the chest. This gives you the darkness crystal, at which point you have officially won the game. The darkness crystal has a charge attack that grants you HP. So essentially, if you time it well, there's practically no longer a chance of you dying. This is insanely overpowered. I'm almost tempted to call it the game's biggest blunder, to be honest. I know it's a secret chest, but to give you something this powerful? My god. There's really no longer any excuse if I die. Okay, so maybe I forgot about what the crystal was used for for a while. At the end of the stage, there's some rats. They're kind of weird looking and fuzzy, but they're really weak. Okay, so in this room, we have some giant slimes and some bombs. The giant slimes are capable of spawning miniature slimes indefinitely, which is annoying. Now is a good time to talk about the magic upgrade we received from killing the wyvern boss. You can now combine up to four elemental stones. If you use four of the same element, a familiar is summoned for a short time. In the case of four air gems, it can shoot lightning strikes repeatedly as well as a tornado, making it a pretty powerful summon. Frankly, I haven't tended to use the other ones due to how powerful the green gems are. I should also point out the craziness of the magic system now, as I probably won't get another chance. You've probably noticed I mostly talk about magic in terms of using the same gems in combination, rather than mixing and matching. This is because it's simply easier. You can combine them in any way you want to, to achieve different effects, but consider the numbers you're looking at. There's four types of gems, you can use up to four of them in any number of combinations. That's up to 256 possible combinations. So yeah, for ease I'll be using the same gems, but there's a lot of room for experimentation. After killing the slimes, head over to the exit, where you'll get a cutscene. Ah, damn, the door's locked. Elise tries pulling on it, but it's not moving. Chant starts referencing other video games, but they aren't really applicable here. We can't light torches, just destroy them. It's starting to look hopeless, when suddenly, Ira shows up. Hey, that's the first time we've seen her in-game sprite since the beginning of the game. She says that Fortuna had opened the door for her, back when Ira and Elma had challenged the boss. Or, at least, that's what I always assumed. She actually says that she was alone back then, so I guess she had already wiped Elma's memory before she got here and simply challenged the boss on her own. She asks if Chant and Elise are ready. They seemed more determined than ever. So, Ira opens the gate for them. Chant and Elise exit through the door, where we're greeted with another cutscene. It seems that after defeating the Wyvern, while we were transported to another place, so too was Elma. But she appears to have gotten the short end of the stick. Elma is sealed away in some kind of a cavern, unable to escape. Even her magic is failing her. Hmm? What's taking so long? Hey, get out of here! It seems she knows now that she was meant to die a long time ago and takes being here as some kind of punishment for persisting. She seems to accept that she'll be locked away forever, until suddenly a voice breaks through the darkness. Who could it be? Oh, my man has returned! I love how everyone is so put off by him. I need a new game just based around this priest, I swear to god. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. He probably wouldn't like me saying that. The priest reveals that Fortuna had requested the priest to watch after Elma and Ira. It seems that Fortuna also locked Elma in here for a special reason, as at the back of the cave there's a mural much like what was seen at the Ignan ruins. But this one is complete. The swords maiden in the image has three lights around her. But if Elise only has chant, that means she must be missing something, right? Elma now realizes what has to be done, and races off to join them. Chant and Elise, meanwhile, have to face off against something of their own. That stench. The stench of humans and fairies. Those who sealed me. They return yet again to continue our endless waltz. I will crush you into powder this time, mortals. 
Just then, a shadow appears, and it looks exactly like a silhouette of Elise. Ah yes, the greatest game trope, a fight against a shadow of yourself. Of course, as with everything, the final boss sequence isn't free from secret treasures. Shadow Elise is capable of using magic just as Elise herself is, but it is much more powerful. Now is finally the time I take advantage of the Earth Crystal. Oh, and the Darkness Crystal, since Shadow Elise hits like a truck. Bait out her attack, and when the time is right, slam her into the ground. But I ask you, what could be better than one Shadow Elise? Two Shadow Elises, of course! This fight gets hectic, particularly when they use the fire gems. It sends out a wave of fire that chases you around, and if they're both doing it, good luck dodging! Still, nothing is impossible. Pick the right times to attack, use the darkness crystals for healing, and eventually you'll be triumphant. Chant seems to be getting tired. Elise is getting worried, but Chant reassures her. Still, they aren't done yet. Only a fraction of your precious dust remains, mortals. And what you defeated was simply a shadow. Behold! You face an archdevil, mortals. You still challenge me. He who stands over you like a god. Come on, then. Strive against your fate for all it will do. Chant looks ready to go, but Elise is scared now. She fears that if they keep fighting, Chant will disappear. Ira steps in though. She tells Chant and Elise to leave the rest to her. She intends to seal him away using her power, sacrificing herself in return. Looks like she's following in Fortuna's footsteps after all. Chant and Elise obviously are not pleased with this idea. They owe a lot to Ira after all. Elise tries to compel her to stop, but Ira has already made up her mind, and so steps in to begin sealing the Archdevil. But wait! What's this? Oh, it's Elma! Return to fairy form! Okay, okay. Earlier, I said Elma in Elise's form was the cutest thing I'd seen. I've changed my mind. This is the cutest character design I've ever seen. Just look at it! It's good that the Archdevil waits so patiently in the back there while we talk things out. Apparently, because Elise has taken the Blue Rose, she's more resistant to fairy dust than she would have been otherwise, meaning she can now accept help from Elma, too. So, here we are now. Elise, the Swords Maiden, and her three lights, Chant, Elma, and Ira. Without Elma and Ira's help, Chant would use up all her dust for sure. It's only with them that we can hope to defeat the Archdevil, and Ira won't be sacrificing herself after all. Now, the Forgotten Archdevil. This is surprisingly a pretty simple fight. And of course it has a secret. Equip your fishing rod, cast it at the Archdevil. Er, cast it at the Archdevil. Catch it. Damn it. Okay, okay, there. Ah, fuck. The legendary shield. Nice. Okay, so the Archdevil. His two arms are vulnerable, but his center is not. After destroying the arms, he'll drop a bunch of gems. The basic idea is that you need to summon a familiar and then use the opposite element to hurt him, otherwise you'll do terrible damage. In my case, I'll summon the wind familiar and use the earth crystal to beat his ass down, which is the most effective strategy. In the meantime, avoid his fire wheels and the several bombs he sends out, and of course use the darkness crystal as needed. BOOM! Yeah, he doesn't like that, does he? It seems now that the Archdemon is resorting to dirty tactics, staying far out of range of our strikes, and with no gems around, we can't cast magic. Elma swears in French, that's weird. Elise apologizes that she couldn't kill the Archdevil before, but Elma has an idea. She's going to focus her power into a point. 
Elise can then hit it with her sword and launch it at the Archdevil. Nothing seems to happen, though. The power dissipates as soon as we try to hit it. According to Ira, Elise and Alma aren't used to working together, so it doesn't work. So, Chant steps in. After all, who's better than herself to match Elise's rhythm? They've been traveling together all this time. Elise, of course, has reservations. Chant is low on dust, and if she uses any more, she might disappear forever. Chant assures her that won't happen, though. With that, Chant swaps in. She can apparently do the exact same thing as Elma was doing earlier now. That's convenient. Oh, and if you thought the actual final boss was devoid of a secret treasure, you're wrong. Jump on each of the three platforms and our final secret treasure appears. So the final final boss is pretty simple, it just fires stuff at you from afar. It isn't particularly powerful, just avoid its attacks while launching your own. The main struggle is just that it takes so long, to be honest, but just keep at it and finally BOOM AGAIN! But wait, something's happening. Oh no, he's trying to seal HIMSELF away to escape, so he can lick his wounds and start the cycle all over again. We can't have that, we're so close! Chant tells Elise to throw her sword at him. She plans to put as much dust on the sword as possible, hopefully killing the Archdemon. But if she does that, she'll disappear, won't she? Well, Elise seems to trust her at least. So, in the words of Chant, Elise, heave that mother! Uh-oh. Elma detects that the evil has faded, but Chant is nowhere to be seen. Alma and Ira already knows what happened. Chant is dead. Elise, however, is more hopeful. Chant said she wouldn't disappear, and she trusts her big sister. But her optimism soon fades, and her face gives away her fears. Ira begins to console her when she notices the medicine vial lying on the ground. Apparently, Chant asked that they keep the medicine, but they now notice the vial has been emptied. So, it turns out Chant hadn't been using her fairy dust at all. But wait, wouldn't that mean- Oh, you clever little bitch, Chant. And she wastes no time rubbing her cleverness in everyone's face. Wait, though, she's still a fairy, right? Shouldn't she and Elma have transformed back by now? Oh, great. Apparently they still have so much magic in them that they won't be human again just yet. Sort of a shame, it would have been nice to see what their true forms looked like. Well, there we go. That's Chantelise. I think it's obvious, but I love this game. From its writing and themes, to its tone, to its art style, to its music, and of course its detailed and difficult combat. The game itself only takes around 5-6 to six hours doing everything. Despite that, I've put nearly 100 hours in it over the past few years. It's a ton of fun, and I'd highly recommend playing it for yourself. As I said at the start, Reketeer has always been the more popular game of the two, but for me personally, Chantelise has always been the one that spoke to me more. I hope I've inspired you to give the game a chance yourself. Even outside of the main game, there's plenty of bonus content and some character interactions with the townsfolk that I didn't even point out. I'd of course like to thank Ryan for voicing the kid in town, and Milk for screaming CAPITALISM, Capitalism HO! Oh! Well, that's all from me. Regardless of what you decide, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time.